and this stuff has been going locally here, hydroponically enforced in a bit less in the country. So, you know, legalisation for me personally, from the experiences I had and the people I've met, and um, you know, I haven't, you know, the qualifications stand over this that you could formally say about on some university. The only experience I have is the life experience I've had dealing with people engaged in the drug scene all my life. Legalisation for me would not be the way to go. The decriminalisation of addicts, yes, the criminalisation of people, particularly young people, that get themselves in a bit of a bind because it becomes a criminal justice matter and I'm tied to certain court laws that I have to deal with. You know, there's only a certain amount of flexibility that I can have and the system allows me to have. But anything that gives people an opportunity to get away, I would agree with you totally. And, you know, going back to a point that Philly made, Life is all about choices, particularly young people. Keep your choices simple. Everybody can't be everything. Everybody can't be, you know, an Olympic gold medal winner or an all Ireland winner with all due respect. But in my experience of all the people I've dealt with in very difficult situations, and I try and do something for them or send them to somebody that would be able to do something for them, there's something for everybody in life. There's something for everybody. Everybody has something to offer to themselves, to their families, to society, and to the world in general. The trick is trying to identify that thing. My, my view on it is keep it simple. Do the simple things and enjoy the simple things. Don't be trying to look for Mark Zuckerberg stuff and Facebook stuff and all this sort of stuff. That's the only advice I can give. There's a professor in this field, and he traveled the world internationally. He studied every single country, and their legalization, decriminalization, their laws, international controls, all of those things. His name is Ethan Needleman. You can watch his video on YouTube. His view, after having done an extensive, incredible amount of work on it, was three days a week, I think we should keep drugs illegal. I'm not decriminalizing it either. Three days a week, I think we should decriminalize it. I think we should legalize it. And one day a week, I don't know what to do. And that was his view after having studied internationally, having studied all of the laws, all the regulations, international controls. The jury is still out on that one. Thanks, Christina. We, we kick off a little bit late. I did say about an hour and a half, so we're, we're, we're kind of bang on the mark on that. I want to, from the top of the stage here, again, I want you to put your hands together for Trevor and the Omar Hills. I know I'm the Omar Hills. Thank you. Thank you. I have actually worked out to do with tonight. So Trevor, well done, Niall and Joan and Gangi. To yourselves and their orders, GEA, most of you are all GEA members, thank you very much for coming. And the last round of applause for our three guest speakers. Thank you very much. And that's it, so look at Trevor, that's that's us. Sir Trevor, just want to say one word and then we're then anyone that wants to say Philly is sticking around there, so anyone that wants to come to him by all means. Uh, sorry folks, just very briefly, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending this evening. Um, we all know how accessible drugs and alcohol is in societies today. It doesn't matter if you're in Kaluni, Kulak, Ballastair or Ballymun, drugs are available in every corner of the country. And I urge all young people here tonight to think of the option and the consequences they are around using drugs. The youth here have to make the choice that, like Philly did, and when he, where he wanted his life to go. After hearing Philly's story, we all know the challenges that he faced to get where he wanted today. And I ask you all to make the same choice. If you encounter problems along the way, there is always someone to talk to. Your manager, your mentor, your peers, and especially your parents. Don't be scared to talk to your parents. They're the, one, they're the ones who only want best for you in life, and please talk to them. I would like to thank the parents, managers and mentors who brought their kids to the event this evening. You have shown all how much you care about these kids and you will be there for them if there is a problem. I ask all parents and mentors to make all other adults in life aware of the drug abuse in society today and be vigilant that, there is, that it is out there in our local community. There is a few people that I have to thank for making this event possible. The Clayton Hotel, the Northwest Drugs Task Force for all their assistance and anything we ask for, they are more willing to help. 
Um, we have a donations bucket outside the door, um, and it is going to the Samaritans, and we all know the great work they do, and uh, they always give an ear to someone that has a problem. Um, and I also want to say a huge thank you to our panel here tonight, Niall Davey, Christina McAlini, and Philly McMahon, of course. Um, they've been a superb panel, and we hope the audience have taken uh, a great deal from the event this evening. And lastly, I would like to thank our MC, Eugene, for doing an excellent job this evening. I think Dolly O'Shea's gig in the Roses for Leaf will be up. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you. 
every single person that dabbled in alcohol or has tried alcohol, as it was said earlier here tonight, nobody intends to be addicted. But every single person in this audience has the potential to be addicted to something. Thanks, Christina. Um, that's on the floor. Anyone just come around and say anyone just yeah, Martin. Uh, I got it done. Thank you. Um, I, I think the biggest problem with um, youngsters at times they're afraid. Say if a person makes a mistake, to go to someone and try and take them out of order and say this is wrong. And I just give you, it's not to, really to do with a drug as such, but it's just where someone was taken in, there was a bit of, little bit of black yard and what have cars. And he was afraid to rat on what was a friend of his. But what happened when he didn't rat at that stage, the other guy got into a way bigger bother down the road and got into serious problems. Uh, I think if you, if you, it's, it's not wrong to tell if you see that something is wrong or confide in someone. And because all you're doing is saving it down the road, they're getting into deeper problems. Um, your talk has been brilliant, Philly. Uh, I think another major problem with youngsters is, not as much now, but I know in the past years, they dropped out of school very early, and they really had nothing to do with themselves. And I made lots of mistakes in life, and no one can up their hand and say they didn't make mistakes. But it's to confide in someone, and because we hear about all the bullying that's going on, and I think there's that fear among people, well, if we do tell her, don't you know, we're bringing a lot of enemies on ourselves. But I guarantee you, if you tell a thing in time, you're saving the person down the road uh, a long way. Thank you. in contact with Nile, and, you know, so, so in fairness, as Martin rightly says, you know, is to confide in them and they're there to talk to us. Um, yeah, Trevor, we've got someone there, good, go ahead. Philly, how you doing? Uh, thanks for coming down, it's great to see you here. Um, I just wanted to know what your views and considering you played at a league level and been able to play with Bang On and the Dubs, uh, in relation to the even occasional use of hash, uh, MDMA, alcohol, what would your opinion be on how that would maybe get you where you want to be in the sporting context, just in your experience? Or even do you look back and thinking, when I would have made a decision and I would have arrived earlier, not to have too bad as it is? Like I, like, I think the big thing is that I think we all understand that, as we mentioned, that drugs are all sorts of social classes. Um, there's guards, there's people that we say that there's guards, there's, there's teachers, there's judges, they've all. In all professions in the work life, they've, they've, they've just been down to their drugs. And, and the big problem is, um, the big problem I see is that, uh, you know, when you have somebody that's made that mistake of, of that, like they feel that there's no way back. I think that's very important that there is a way back. And certainly when you are incriminated at, you know, at the age of 18, that is a big problem that we have nowadays is that people go, do you know what? Look, of a, of, a, of a, you know, problem I have to charge you know, on, on my record. And she might as well just go back, go, go deeper and deeper into it. So, uh, but I do think there's going to be uh, people in, in the audience this evening that will know somebody that, that is messing about a little bit. Um, and ultimately, that's what I'm, and ultimately, we can only try be that communication piece where it comes to me to be. It's alright to talk to you about what, what's going on. Um, I know it's very hard in society nowadays, and, and we have that issue with mental health currently. But there's no. The education that we've had on drug addiction it, it's, it's, it hasn't worked. So that message that we give our kids don't take drugs. Ultimately, we don't want them to take drugs, and ultimately, we want to tell them that, but that hasn't worked. Because we've done fought highest overdose rate in Europe, right? So, and, and it's getting worse and worse, right? So we need to be, and unfortunately, do you know what the hard thing is about when, when kids start experimenting? is the stigma. 
especially in rural counties. The stigma is probably what we're pushing forward and forward on down that long pathway. So I think it's important that we realise that we're not all perfect. We will make mistakes. And my my opinion on our current policy is that you know it's important to realise that there's a person behind the problem. There's a person behind the problem. So if there's somebody within the team that's messing about with something, so there's, there's generally an underlying issue. You know, don't judge that person because of the bad choice they made. Just remember what you can help them. So uh, I think that's very important. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just take if there's, if there's one more question. I take there's one way down the back, Trevor. Just if you just put on there, just wait till he gets the mic for one second. Just when Trevor's walking his way down there, when you are going out this evening. Uh, you'll notice uh, there was a little box there with the Samaritans, uh, so that's actually who, uh, if you do want to give a donation or maybe you didn't come in, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's the charity that uh, we're going to use this evening. So there's little boxes there on the way out if you do want to give a donation. Now, go ahead down there, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Philly, for coming tonight. Uh, my question is for the three members of the panel. Uh, you mentioned there are two classes of drugs, some which are legal and some which are, are illegal. Do you think that uh, some of those drugs which are currently illegal should be legalised or not? That's for all three members of the panel. <coughs> Christina, it's there, it's all. Okay, I'm going to briefly answer this. And it's, it's a situation where drugs have always been around, drugs will always be around, and human beings will respond to drugs in similar ways that they have always responded to drugs. As an academic and a researcher, a teacher and a lecturer, a family person and a mother and a community member, there are things that are happening at the moment as far as legalization, decriminalization, and people's views on drugs. We respond positively because our brain is wired that way to the feelings that we get from these substances. But the side effects from these substances affect every single individual differently. I won't give a personal view because I know that much about it. I know that much about every one of the drugs. And if you want my own view, my own view is I personally, believe it or not, avoid any of them. I do drink. I'm all the time. I am so aware of the risk, and particularly you will hear health promotion adverts around the links between cancer and alcohol and IDs. The more that we know, the more risk there is there. What we do know about them as well is that some people can dabble and get away from it. And some people become addicted. There's lots of risks, lots of side effects, lots of costs. So at the moment, it really is a case of what's that space. But if your goal is to live healthy and well, to reach your potential, to do good things in life, to love yourself, love your family, love others, and love the community that you live in, the best advice that I can offer is just try and stay away from it. That's my advice on it. Thanks, Priscilla. So, uh, do I believe drugs should be legalised? Uh, I'm kind of on the fence for this one. Uh, in Switzerland, actually, they have a legalised heroin program where um, it's a very good program that monitors drug addicts coming in and makes it a heroin reduction uh, program. And funny enough, um, in 15 years, they've had no deaths and overdoses. And they've had massive, um, massive results in terms of uh, recovery. So, it depends on your country as well, it depends on your health system. Uh, if you look at Portugal, they've decriminalised drugs, so what they've done is decriminalised the human being. So if you're caught with, with drugs, a uh, small quantity of personal use, you are put in front of a persuasion committee that's essentially dealt with the healthcare system and not the criminal justice system. If you commit a crime, 
and you, it's, it's a drug related crime, you have to go to the, the, the criminal justice system and you're dealt with that crime, and then you also go to the, the healthcare system and the, the drug addiction. Um, and it's, um, I, I was in Portugal last year, uh, kind of researching about it. It's a really good option for this country. Uh, it's a really good option for decriminalisation, and, and a lot of people think that there's a massive fear around because they feel that the floodgates will open. People don't take drugs, you know, whether it's decriminalised or not. It's happened. We can't win the war on drugs. We've lost it, we're thinking that way. Uh, but we need to manage it better. So that's the big thing in, in, in relation to our policy. So legalisation is probably a step past decriminalisation. There has to be a massive amount of money put into the healthcare system. Funny enough, like for the mental health care, uh, sorry, for the mental health um, department, I think it's like 6.5% of the, the GDP, of the, the budget that we've got from, you know, 6.5% from the people that are, you know, really short in life. It's, and then there's a small percentage of that that goes to drug addiction, that goes to drugs, uh, department. So it's it's kind of a, a losing battle at the minute in terms of what way the country is, is looking towards drug addiction. Considering in 2015 we had 670 odd deaths, drug related deaths, 400 odd mental health deaths, we had 100 odd car uh, you know, deaths from, 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 from car uh, incidents and accidents. And it's brilliant to see that we have this event, darkness in the light, where we have 100 million people in Phoenix Park and fundraising for mental health. I don't see anybody fundraising or talking about drug addiction. 600 odd people have died in 2015, 300 odd last year. Do you know how many have died in Portugal? Less than 10. So decriminalisation is a model that I think we should look at. We need change in anyway. So whatever that may be, I'm open to it. Someone says decriminalisation is not the way, but this is the way it works. I'm delighted. Because hopefully that'll save somebody that was potentially a job. Um, so yeah, I think that's the way we go. Legalisation is probably too far down the road. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's finally now you can have a word on that. Thanks, um, Yeah, it's it's one that I have to be careful what I say here that it wouldn't be misinterpreted. I agree with a lot of what Philly has said. Uh, sometimes I think people make the mistake. They get confused between the term decriminalization and legalization. Decriminalization is a completely different thing to legalization. And I look at the example of, say for instance, the drug courts in Dublin, and Philly probably would know a little bit about this. I think there's a case to be made for a drug court all over the country. And it's definitely about decriminalizing the individual, particularly ones that's engaged in personal use or particularly people with addictions. And we come across, believe it or not, here in Sligo on the North Coast, people with addictions every day in both descriptions. Just to say one little interesting fact, when I joined the Garris Force in 1985, when I went to Dublin and I was in the inner city, I was in around Pier Street and Harper Terrace and all around Stevens Green area and that, and the first experience I met people using drugs and engaged in a bit of drug use. A fellow with a bit of hash, 20 quids worth of hash in his pocket that time. I was looking at this stuff and Jesus, my father had me back broke in the ball getting stuff like this out of the ground first. It looked like a bit of tough. The THC content in that bit of hash back in 1985 was a certain percentage. The cannabis you buy today, the herb of cannabis, the weed that we're coming across today, the analysis that we're getting back from the Forensic Science Bureau shows that the THC content in that cannabis it was roughly around five times stronger now than it was in that bit of ash that was coming in from North Africa or wherever it was coming from that time. It's dark and I want to complain. Right? And then I'll do a little trigger to change my mood. I'll, I'll get up and I'll go into the, the bathroom and I'll look in the mirror and I'll smile for five seconds. And my girlfriend will be like, oh, you're not doing this again, eh? <laughs> and then sometimes I'll laugh for five seconds. And it's just a, a split second, a split trigger to change my the power of choice from negative to positive. Because ultimately, right, pain and suffering is going to happen to us all. There's nobody in this world, there's nobody in, the, in this world that won't go through pain and suffering. 
That's a very important message, especially when it comes to mental health. We've got to understand our biology. Right? We have a lot of problems with drugs because of mental health. Because a lot of the times, addicts will use drugs to cover over the pain. And I strongly believe that drug addiction is a mental health issue instead of a criminal justice issue. I strongly believe that. 80% of drug addicts have childhood mental health issues. It's classed as a special death when somebody dies from an overdose. So that's the same special death when someone dies from suicide. It takes around four years to grieve from a special death. And the pain is the equivalent of two deaths. So you will find your own trigger. Because I strongly believe that there's two types of people in this world. There's people that will give energy and there are people that will take it away. You'll see them all the time. There'll be plenty of each of them in this room. If you just looked at a person next to you right now and smiled, do that now. <laughs> so, there's a, there's, a, there's a little guy here with a sligo top and there's a guy with a mayo top and they're not looking at each other like this. <laughs> Forget the colours tonight, alright? Forget the jerseys tonight. So you just give each other energy through a smile. That's all it takes. Because ultimately, when you're six foot under, what do you want to be remembered for? I'll tell you what I want to be remembered for. It's not how many all worlds I have. It's not how much money I have. It's not where I lived. It's not what, what clothes I had, what brand of clothes I had. It's not material, this stuff. It's not, it's what energy did Philly McMahon give? That's what I want to know. So I'm very fortunate that in 2015, when I started speaking about my brother John's addiction, that very soon after that, I understood that I had a purpose in life. And there's not many people that can say that. It's a really special thing when you have a purpose in life. I remember we had this, I brought the Sam McGuire into my house, and it was like the Batman sign. All these kids ran over, pictures and autographs, went in, came back out, one of the the younger brothers of the kid says, can I get a picture? I didn't get it when you were on the way in. I said, no problem. And um, he says to me, are you famous? And I said, oh. I was in my head, I was like, Jesus, do I say yes or no? <laughs> and before I said that, he said, ah, you must be. You're on telly all the time. And I said, oh, yeah, I am, yeah, yeah. And he says, well, actually, you can't be famous. I said, what is that? He says, you're from Ballymore. <laughs> so I sat down with the kid on the path. There was me, the Sam McGuire, and this kid sitting on the back. I'm sure people are driving by and going, what the hell is going on there? I don't know what I gave that kid that day. I don't know. But I know what I got from it. I felt amazing. I felt I got such a buzz from it. And I went and spoke to a friend who's a personal development coach, and I said, look, this is what happened. And I felt great. And I felt I've done something. And I got really good energy from it. And he said, Philly, do you know what you need to do? Get the biggest path as possible and get as many people on it. That's your purpose in life. So I love coming around and speaking all over the country to people, no matter what age, no matter what background you have, giving you that information around halftime talk and the power of choice. We have about 60,000 thoughts a day, on average. And 80% of them are negative. And they're from male, it might be 90%. <laughs> I'll be saying slowly go be more. <laughs> so we are we are constantly chasing positivity, okay? So half time talk, pain and suffering is, is inevitable. It's gonna happen to us all, right? We constantly ch chase positivity. Right? We're, we're bombarded with this consumer culture of being more, wanting more, buying more. Right? We're bombarded. You'll have constantly people telling you. You have to be positive, all right? And I'm gonna tell you the opposite tonight. Stop chasing positivity, all right? Because what state of mind do you have to be in if you're chasing positivity? 
generally a negative state, state of mind. It's when you accept negativity, the byproduct is positivity. When I realized that it's okay to talk about my brother's addiction, it was a weight off my shoulders. I got so much positivity from it. It's led me to where I am today. But we are constantly chasing positivity. When we know, as human beings, the high fixes don't work, whether that's buying something that is materialistic to you, or that's a drug, or that's alcohol, these quick fixes don't really work. I have an addiction, and we're all addicts by the way, let me tell you that. I have an addiction. When I was a kid, I was in school, and uh, my mom bought me a brand new pair of runners, and I walked in, and this kid said to me, oh, them runners are cool, I like them. And I was buzzing. I was like, oh yeah, thank you. Someone complimented me. Then after that, every time I felt bad, what do you think I did? Give me man for money for runners. I feel bad, give me money, give me money for runners. What do you think an addict does? When they feel bad, they constantly look for this drug. It's the same process. It's the same process. And you know what? Substance-based addicts are the lucky ones. They're lucky. Why are they lucky? Because they know after a short period of time that they have a problem. They'll take a hit for the buzz the first time. They'll take it a second time. And do you know what they'll all say? I won't take it again. And then they take it again. And then they get another buzz because they do their way with their mates. And then what happens? They wake up one morning with the worst flu they've ever, ever had. The worst flu. They take all the medication to try to get rid of that flu. And the only medication that gets rid of that flu is the drug. And that's how you become an addict. That is no different to somebody that craves a pair of rubbers to make themselves feel good. It is no different to the dopamine release you get when you're on Facebook and you get likes and comments and shares. It's the same thing. Right? It's the same thing. And if we're saying that we're, we are, we, our thoughts are generally negative, so our thoughts are generally negative because we're saying 80% of them on average. What do we do? How do we become positive? I'll tell you how we do it. Who's a fan of Conor McGregor in here? Yeah, I'd say about a year ago there was much more fans, right? <laughs> and then he loses or then he pisses people off on social media. Oh, I hate him. I'm glad you lost Conor McGregor. And we've begrudged That's what we are. We feel that we need to put other people down to make ourselves feel better. And I'll never forget, I was doing a talk in DCU, and I was chatting about the power of choice and being positive, and this guy in the back puts his hand up, and he says, Philly, you're talking about being positive, and you're a knacker on the pitch. <laughs> I was like, oh, Jesus. Right, that's that conversation got out the window. And I said to him, look, when I was younger, I, because of the policy that we have currently in this country, we had back then, there's a stigma around addiction. There's a horrible negative stigma around addiction. Right? And I built up a lot of anger and embarrassment towards my brother's addiction. And how I vented that anger and aggression was on the pitch. I was very lucky to have a coach in Paddy Christie see the energy I had. He says, I'm gonna put that in the sport. And I became a very aggressive footballer. And that got me on the Dublin team. And that got me placed in the Dublin team and, and helped my team win. And if we team won, then potentially we won all Ireland. If we win all Ireland, potentially I develop a profile to help others. And then I just done that one. <laughs> so it came from a positive, it came from a positive, a negative place, but turned it to something positive. So, don't chase positivity. And finally, finally, life is all about solving problems. Think about it. Anything you do in life is about solving problems. Anything. So it's important to realize 
that everybody has them. And the ones that solve them the most are the ones that grow the most. They're the ones that grow the most. I'm not saying go and take drugs and learn from it. I'm saying the smart people will see the people that have gone through it and go the opposite way like I did. My brother John, I was very fortunate and unfortunate that he went the same way in life. And that pushed me further and further into sport. So there's only, you know, there's, there's two ways you can take success. Make the mistakes until you realise what way, what way it works. Or follow, follow somebody and, and let them make the mistakes and, and bypass it. And that's what, use me to do that. I'm here to tell my story, use me to do that. So everybody in this room tonight, where are you in your game? My brother John got 21 minutes and he was taken off. He won't get, like us all. 21 minutes in, taken off. Where are you in your game now? What sort of performance have you had up to now? And what are you going to have in your second half? What's your second half performance going to be? So I'm going to finish up with this. If anybody gets this, I don't know if you want it, but I'll give you a book, right? One of my books. What's the biggest mistake we make in life? Now you, the people shout out answers, it won't be the wrong answer, right? But my answer I'm looking for, if someone gets it, I'll give them a book, right? What's the biggest mistake? <coughs> Regret. Regret, no. Failure. Failure, no. Not They're not wrong, by the way, just not the one I'm looking for. <laughs> Learning from your mistakes. No, not the one I'm looking for. Any more? Sorry? Looking back. Looking back? No. No. All good answers. Thinking that you made mistakes? Thinking that you made mistakes? No. Give it two more. Two more attempts and then I keep the book for myself. <laughs> <laughs> two more. Sorry? You think that you've made it. You can't hear that. Someone translate that country you've uh, <laughs> <laughs> made it. Think you've made it? Is it is it if you've made it? Think that you made it. Think, think, that, think that you made it. No. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> Care about what others think of you. No. Uh, good answer. No. Right, here it is. No. <laughs> you think you have more time. Right, we think we have more time. That's why we're reactive in society. Time is the most valuable thing we have. Mark Zuckerberg is essentially selling crack cocaine in the terms of social media. Right? Social media won't kill you, but it'll take a massive amount of your time away. It's just the most valuable thing you'll have in life. So we think we have more time. Right? My brother, I'm sure, if we went back in time and said to him, at the age of 31, you're going to die, and it's going to be, the drugs are going to have a huge toll on your death, would he have changed? I would have said, yes, definitely. He definitely would have. So where are you in your game? Have your halftime talk this evening. Realize the biology of pain and suffering. We're all going to get it. It makes you, it makes you stronger as a person. If you have pain and suffering and you can't sort it out, go and get help. But realize that pain and suffering make you stronger. <coughs> Stop chasing positivity. Chasing positivity is a negative thing. And realize that we're all, all, all we do in life is solve problems. And when you solve one problem, it opens the door for another. And you just keep doing it. So this is your, your halftime talk tonight, I hope. I hope you all go out and enjoy your second half of your, your game. And um, thanks very much for inviting me up and well done to all the organizers on, that have been uh, sorting out. Look, the audience that's here, it's, it's amazing, it's brilliant. Um, I, would, I would have wished that my brother and me would have had this when we were grown, we didn't before. So, so thanks very much um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have.
So look, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, in fairness, uh, Philly did as well. I'll say he do a photo shoot as well, right? So we're gonna. <laughs> so if anyone knows when I get a photograph, but I'm bored away from at the at the end of the proceeding. So look, we're just gonna open the floor. If someone has a few questions, I'm gonna give this mic to Trevor, and, and in case if anyone has a question or two that they'd like to ask. Um, and as Nile said, look at it, and he said to me earlier today, it's, it's informing everybody. And look at it, if you have a question, you want to just post a night on the local scene by all means. Or if you have a question to Christina or Philly, by all means, just ask away. Sure. Anyone for a question, folks? Are they going there? Just, um, just, well, I, I just kick off one there for, uh, just to sort of say to myself, now you just on a, on a local level, probably from your point of view, if I suppose, uh, we'd say, how long, just on a practicality thing, if someone is caught in possession of, of illegal substances, like, what are the consequences? You know, and not, I mean, the what kind of... Well, generally there's two offences, there's what's called Section 3 and Section 15 of the Misuse of Drugs Act, and there's also what's called Section 15A of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Section 3 of the Misuse of Drugs Act is simple possession for personal use, and that would be what's called a district court matter summary matter, so you probably end up before this local district court if you're over 18 years of age. Under 18 years of age, we generally try to deal with young people through the juvenile liaison system. Um, you get a chance, you receive a formal caution, it's not a conviction, it's not a record that's recorded on the system. It doesn't impact either for my job in writing uh, police or any characters for you that might be more forward for a job in their life, that doesn't appear on that. But once you get over 18 years of age and you're deemed an adult, then it becomes a criminal justice matter. Uh, you know, uh, it can be difficult because some of the amounts can be quite small and these things happen where, you know, we may be searching something for a bigger amount, we miss the bigger amount, but somebody's caught a little bit of stuff for personal use. Section 15 of the Misuse, Misuse of Drugs Act then is a, a quantity of a controlled drug, be it cannabis, heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, that's deemed sufficient for the purposes of sale and supply. And there's a graduated scale and there's all sorts of uh, things that influence that. Uh, each drug has a different street value. Each drug has a different quantity value for the purposes of sale and supply. That's my call sometimes a lot of the time. Other times it's a matter of it's big enough to go to the DPP. And that ends up in the judge and jury court where you see the fellows with the wigs. And that's a little bit heavy for anybody, particularly young people, you know. And uh, that is life changing and life altering, you know. Uh, I'm not trying to be facetious about it or anything like that, but if you get to that stage, it's definitely a time to have that talk with somebody, I think, you know. And then the 15A charge is the ultimate serious charge where you're caught in a quantity of drugs that's over a certain monetary value, and that then is a certain court job with judge and jury. And, Mandatory ten year sentence comes on later. Nobody wants to go there. Yeah, Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Philly. Thanks, one just I'm just something I just thought and it probably might be relevant to, to a lot of people in the in the room. Philly, this is a particular for you, I suppose. Yeah, how did you cope when I suppose that people would use this peer pressure in your locality? Um I, I was very fortunate that um, the guys so the guys that I would have hung around with at the age of maybe 15, 16 who just got into crime and, um, and taking drugs. And I was at that stage starting to separate into playing sport and, and, and disassociate with them and, and hang around with another group of guys that were more into sport than, than crime and, 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 um, and drugs. But I suppose um, I was very fortunate again that my brother John pushed me and stood, stared me away from from drugs and the lads would have the lad hung around would have would have feared to give actually offer me drugs or alcohol um, because of the drug would have had a few words in them. Um, but, but again I think it all stems from a lot of the, the crimes that we have in, in our prison services at the minute um, are kind of related to self image and self confidence at a very main. So I'll give you an example. I have a guy in my group um, and he 
His father was a bouncer. It has a detrimental effect for young people in the long term if they end up being brought into the criminal justice system, if they end up with any type of a conviction or anything else like that, because it closes so many life's opportunities and doors on your progress through life. Almost daily, I receive correspondence through the management offices in the Irish Chicago looking for what's called police certificate of character, police references, and the main question on them all is, has the person in question any association with or any criminal history with drug involvement? And that closes the door straight away on possibly what that applicant is looking for, be it a visa, be it a work placement in some of the larger companies in this country or worldwide, travel opportunities, you name it. And, you know, these are not the things that cross your mind Sometimes as young people when you start to do a little bit of experimentation or start to do a little bit of inquiring about the big bad world out there. Another thing that struck me about Christine's presentation was in relation to alcohol and cigarette abuse. And I'm sure Philly might talk about this in relation to his journey. Is We come across a lot of young people in our work that start experimenting with drugs uh, in their mid to late teens. But it would seem that they always have started the journey by experimenting with alcohol or cigarettes or something like that at a very young age, 10, 11, 12, whatever it may be, a little bit older. And I'm not anti-drink, don't get me wrong, I take a drink myself and I enjoy a night out and everything else. But I would say to people, I've met people through my life who were addicts, who were in a very lonely place, who were very, you know, at the end of their tether wondering, you know, what do I do, where do I go? No young person, I would suggest, ever takes a drink at 10, 12, 14 with it in the back of their mind that someday down the road I might be an alcoholic, I might have an addiction. No young person ever takes a cigarette and continues smoking with some thought in the back of their mind that I may have a serious medical condition, respiratory or otherwise, because I smoke. I smoked myself for a short period of time when I was a young fellow. And I played a lot of sport, I played a lot of football, I played a lot of soccer. And one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was smoking cigarettes. Because it affected me so much in later life when I wanted to continue for an extra year or two playing a bit of ball. And I gave it up after a very short period of time. Um, drugs uh, that we're coming across there's a number of facets that we see now at the moment that are worrying for me personally and some of the people I work with. Drug debt intimidation is one of the big things that we're dealing with almost on a weekly basis. And when I say drug debt intimidation, people might, you know, consider the bigger story and say like what you're coming across in Dublin City or that, where you hear all this media attention about cartels and feuds and disputes, we're coming across young people who have got engaged in a bit of experimentation, experimentation with drugs. And they've been offered drugs on an ad hoc basis, i oh, just try this out or whatever else. And in a very short space of time, somebody comes to them and says, you owe me 200 euros. You owe me 500 euros. What's all this about? And suddenly they're in a position that they're intimidated or coerced into doing something that they don't necessarily want to do. And we're seeing that at a local level in small quantities, in real terms, or small quantities to the likes of me, in cash, in cash numbers. But for young people in their late teens, early 20s, it's a tremendous amount of money when somebody talks about 2,000 euros, 4,000 euros, 5,000 euros. And that can build up in a number of weeks. And then you have the added input into it that where a young person is mobile, and when I mean mobile, somebody with a car has a drug debt of 1,000 or 1,500 euros, suddenly has to go to Dublin. And you'll be told when you get there where you have to go. And you'll be told where you get there when you're, when you're told where to go, you'll be told who you're going to meet. And then you'll be told what you're going to do when you meet that person and what you're going to put in your car and bring back. 
and that's just a general a generalization but it has so many other elements to it and so many other things that people are being coerced into doing it's amazing another little misnomer we find out there particularly with younger people from the age of say 14 15 up to the 20 22 age mark we stop and search people all the time and they have this uh, misapprehension that you haven't the entitlement to stop me or haven't the entitlement to search me. The power that we have under the Misuse of Drugs Act is so far ranging and so wide that on any reasonable base suspicion, we can stop and search anybody, anywhere, at any location. And then, if necessary, bring them back to a guard station. We can do a cursory search. But we do not search people and stop people willy-nilly. We stop people for a reason. And then we get this thing from kids to say, well, you can't look at my mobile phone. And the one message I would get out there to parents, it's unbelievable what we're seeing on mobile phones when we look at them. Because we have the power under the Drugs Act to look at the phone and if necessary, seize it, take it back to the station. We can analyze its content. And some of the, some of the chatter that's on some of these phones, some of the stuff that kids are putting up there as messages, some of the links that they're making is, you know, it's from inappropriate to downright dangerous in some cases. And I'm not saying that it's widespread, but we are seeing quite a bit of it on some people, on some areas. So I would just say what I said at the start. Kids, be careful. It's all about life choices. I've, I've made a few bad choices in my life over the years. But it doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't look for help or advice or talk to somebody. Parents and adults, all I would say to you is speak to your kids. If you think there is some issue, the one thing you should not do is panic. Keep your kids with you. Keep, them, keep, them, keep the channel of communications open. Work with them. I know that since I've started, People's values under the law have changed. People's values in this country have changed in so many ways. Things have changed radically since I was a young fellow, 15 or 16. It's not the country that, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm not saying, it, it, there's so many things that have changed. And I know that people have a bigger, wider view on a lot of things. I'm not here to preach, I'm not here to say, you know, I'm just here to tell you what we're seeing, what we're experiencing and what we're finding. Anybody that's here, is more than welcome to contact me on a personal basis if you want to discuss any private matter. It happens on a daily basis, I would say to everyone. I get calls all the time from people all over the place, from all areas of the county, both side of the region. And what I would say is our main focus is to try and work with people, work with communities, work with families, and try and use any tactic that we can to divert people away and persuade them that it's not the path to go and try and steer away from the criminal justice system at all costs, particularly with young people. But I would also say that we take a very, very strong line on the criminal use of drugs and supply, and we have a lot of that in our area. We're a very active unit. We've had a lot of success. Hopefully we'll have more success. And only, only with the support of large groups of people and communities and clubs and individuals, can we be successful? And I'd ask you to trust us, to come and meet us, come and talk to us. If you have an issue in your house, in your parish, in your location, whatever it may be, and let's work together to try and handle this. Thanks. And uh, I do know, because probably appropriate just after Niall's uh, presentation, as he said, look, he'd like people to, you know, I think it's important we're, we're all the greater Sligo area here. Um, so just, I'm going to give out Niall's um, phone number there, the mobile number, so and I'll give it out again anyhow, but if you just want to take it down, it's an 086 82 82 273. So it's an 086 number, it's 82 82 273 and as Niall says look at he's there to talk to people and, and that's what it's about engaging with the local with the local uh, the local enforcement so so um, thanks Niall for that okay without further ado 
let's talk to the man that has six Alarna medals and I'm going to shake his hand because I haven't shook a man that has six Alarna medals. Philly McMahon, take the stage, please. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm not going to give my number out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted to come up and, and uh, share a few experiences that I've had in my life and uh, a few philosophies that I've kind of incorporated since speaking about my brother's addiction in 2015. Um, so before I actually get into them philosophies, I just want to uh, tell you a little story about the area I'm from, Ballymun. Um, put your hand in the air if you've heard of Bally Moon. Okay. Put your hand in the air if you've heard of uh, bad things about Bally Moon. Good things about Bally Moon. Yeah, right, yeah. That's the general consensus. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot more, uh, I suppose, in certainly in the media, from the media point of view, a lot of, of, of bad things happen in Bally Moon instead of good things. Um, just to let you know, we've six double players. And a few all Ireland's, so that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, essentially, uh, I want to chat to you about uh, two philosophies. One called the Halftime Talk, and the other called the Power of Choice. It just robbed me presentation for the evening. The power of Choice. So, um, Bally Moon, just to give you a quick background, Bally Moon was, uh, was, was developed because there was overcrowded tenements in the inner city. So, it was the bridge between, very like today, with the homelessness and the, the housing crisis that we have in, in Dublin City um, and, the rest, and around the country. And it was the bridge between the inner city and the airport. So the Ballymun Road went right up through and it was then designed like a Celtic cross. So it was a roundabout and then there was four parts of the community. And the area of, uh, that I'm going to tell you about uh, in Ballymun is called Salogue. And Salogue was actually separated by a massive wall to the next estate, which was Glass Nell. So they used to call it the Berlin Wall. Um, some kids from that area in Slough used to call it the Poshy Wall. And they used to call it the Poshy Wall because they felt that the kids over the wall were posher, okay, obviously. Um, but they spoke differently over there for some reason, uh, even though they were only throw, uh, stone throw away. Um, and even at, at Halloween, some of the kids used to jump over the wall and, and try to rob their sweets, thinking that their sweets would be better. Um, <laughs> So there was kind of a chip on the shoulder from, from the kids from that area from a very young age. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a kid that grew up in that area. And uh, at a very young age, he was kind of always getting up to mischief. The parents were called into school a good bit, um, pulling fire alarms and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and when he was growing up in, in the 80s, Ballymun was rampant with drugs and crime. So it was a focal point for drug dealers because it was just easy, because it was, it was a small condensed area. 20,000 plus people in it. Obviously everybody was living in, in, in flats and on top of each other. So, um, growing up in Ballymun, I don't want to give it a kind of a, a Compton type feel to it. It wasn't, it wasn't as bad as, as what I'll make it out to be, but it wasn't um, full of gangs or anything like that. But there was a phase where you would have to be able to handle yourself or protect yourself, in other words, or get protection off older guys from the same location we're from. And that's what this kid did. Him and his two friends, uh, one was into boxing, one was into, into soccer. And the kid I'm telling you about wasn't really sporty. But he was, um, they, they decided, look, okay, let's, let's, let's hang around with the older guys. Uh, we'll get protection off them and we'll be okay. And, and that's what they did. And, and for that, they had to do same chores. And what they had to do is, uh, they had to sit on the blocks, uh, the age of, let's say, uh, 13 or 14. And the blocks would have a big field at the back, then you'd have that Berlin wall and you'd have glass now. And they'd see kids getting over the wall, walking across the field, like, so they'd be like gazelles walking across. These kids were like lions watching gazelles walking across the field. And they'd be like, okay, they're coming over here for a reason. They're coming over here to buy drugs. And then the guys getting over the wall will obviously be going, boy, there's them kids, the last time we to get drugs, they won't rob us and rip us off. And they'd go up to them and they'd say, where would we get drugs? And they'd say, well, go to the back of the blocks there. There's a guy standing there to give you drugs. And they'd go through, and there'd be the whole group of guys that they'd get protection off standing there. They'd get robbed and they got sent on their way. So there's a lesson in that in itself. The Bible kids helped the glass-nemming kids stay off drugs, right? 
So at the age of 14, the three of them got a lift with one of these guys that they were, felt they were getting protection off. And early in the development of Ballymun, kids realised that you could actually lock yourself in the lift so you could open the inside door, close the outside door, and you'd be locked in the lift. So one of them, they did that, one of them, the older guy, put his hand out with, with a substance in it and said, do you want a bit of this? And one of them said, what is that? And uh, he says, H. So they took it. They were walking down the street after it, and, and the three of them were looking at each other, going, what do we just take there? And one said, I think we took a little bit of hash. And little did they know that that was the first hit of heroin at the age of 14. So ultimately they made the decision and the choice to take the drug, but their environment had a massive influence in them taking the drug. If they were from different, a different community, would they have took the drug? Possibly. But there and then, body one was rampant with heroin, um, cocaine wasn't that big, it was ecstasy, acid, and heroin was the big one. So at the age of 14, they took heroin. And from that, that, that time on, um, they kind of slipped deeper and deeper into a, a really bad pathway in life. And the older guys they hung around with, a lot of them fell deeper into crime and addiction. Four of them passed away in overdose. And they got to the stage where the family of this kid said, look it, his best friends had to pass away, drug overdose. He was clean two years, went back to his father's um, apartment and had one slip and died. Let's get him out of it. It must be the environment, it must be Bally Moore. Get him out of the environment. So they sent him off to London to his cousin and it worked. He became clean because he didn't know any other addicts and he didn't know any other drug dealers. So he became clean for a period. And at that stage, he was around, he was in his 20s, and um, he was tall and, and skinny, and he was six or four, and drugs had taken a toll on his life. So his appearance started to change, his confidence started to change, he found it very hard to socialise, he found it very hard to uh, get a job, and ultimately he didn't feel comfortable around certain people, so he, he, he found his own tribe, which was other addicts. So he f fell back into addiction. And for about four years, he went, to, he went from heroin to methadone, on and off for four years. And in 2012, he was clean from heroin. He was five days away from going to rehabilitation to come off methadone. And he died of a heart arrhythmia. So little did he know that the choices he made, the negative choices he made in his life from a very young age to the time he passed, would have an impact on his younger brother. And his younger brother was seven years younger than him. And his younger brother was a typical brother that wanted to hang around with his older brother. And he used to kick the football off the flats to get close to him. And then what he'd do is he'd run up to his mom and he'd say, he's down there drinking and smoking, and his mom would give him money for sweets. So his little brother was a little rat. Uh, sorry, Gert. Uh, so, Little did he know that that would influence his younger brother then to play GAA in soccer in school, to go on and play for his club by the McKickums, to go on and, ch and, and challenge the standards of his culture. So in other words, to do things that his culture predicted that he couldn't do. Set up his own company, do a degree in DCU, go on to play for the Dubs, and more importantly, to set up a charity in his brother's name to help high risk youths and drug addicts. So I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about at this stage. And if you don't, I'm the younger brother, and that's my older brother, John. And that's my halftime talk. And a halftime talk is when something significant in your life happens and it changes the standards of your life. Some people have it when they do this midlife crisis thing at a certain age of their life. It can come from a mental health point of view, it can come from a breakup, but it will always come from adversity through death. And the funny thing is, when you have a half time talk, you deeply reflect, right? You deeply reflect on what you've done in life. The idea is that you have sport and life, the analogy of sport and life, and essentially, if you take it, GAA, my sport, you go in at half time, you think, right, what, what are the three things I've done well? 
what were the, what were the things we've done bad, right? what we're going to go out and do in the second half to, to have a better game. And that's what half time talk is. So for me, my brother passed away in 2012. I was actually having a good first half. Up until 2012, I was having a good first half. How do I know that? Because I was challenging the standards of my culture. I had an all Ireland in 2011. I had my own company. So I was doing okay. Even more so, I woke up in Mount Joy Tuesdays and Thursdays. And how it came about was uh, we were playing semi final of the club championship and we lost. And uh, I wasn't in a good place. I was walking off the pitch and I signed the kids' jersey. And this guy jumped over the wall and came over to me. And I was like, Jesus, this is a bit weird. And he says, Will you come in and do a talk in Mount Joy? Uh, I'm the governor of Mount Joy. I was like, Whoa. Well, you know, fair play to coming onto the pitch to a person that's just lost a, a, a club championship semi final. Uh, fair play to I'll go and do it. So I went in and we were in the church. And he says, Philly, these cells open at a certain time. I don't know how many's going to be here. He said, It could be five, it could be ten. And they all started walking in. And it was great, there was, a big, there was a big crowd, there was about 50 people there. And then next of all, it was like, oh, there's a bit of a problem here. So the first thing I said to the, to the guys was, listen, I had a story and a script to tell you all about, and I can't actually tell you. And I said, the reason why I can't tell you is that there's five of my mates sitting in front of me that's in the story. So that's why I had a good first half. My friends went down the exact same pathway as my brother's friends. And four of my friends died in overdose. And I have five friends, actually three at the minute, two got released, three at the minute that I'm working on to try to change their self-belief system so when they reintegrate into society that their external environment changes. So I was having a good first half. But was I? Because what I've achieved from 2012 to today it's light years apart. It's light years apart. So, based on my standards of culture, I've achieved a lot more than I thought I could. And I keep on asking that question. I keep on challenging that every chance I get. So the one thing I'd love to give to every single person, no matter what age you are, in this room tonight, if you haven't already had it, have your halftime talk to me. Don't wait till something significant happens before you deeply reflect on life and change your standards. Do it now if you haven't had it already. Because ultimately, we're all reactive, aren't we? We'll wait till something bad happens. We need to be more proactive. All right? We only get one chance of it. So the first message, have your half time talk to me. The next thing then, how do we break that down? How do we walk in that all the time? Because it's very broad. How we do that is through the power of choice. And the power of choice is very simple. All right, it's very simple. I'll give you an analogy. It's like somebody hitting me a box in a match from male. There's a male man in front of me here. <laughs> and I can do two things. The stimulus is the box. I can react and punch back, get sent off, my team potentially loses the game. Or I can respond and go, right, I won't react, I'm going to respond, and I'll get you in the next ball. Clean me. <laughs> That's it. Unfortunately, we don't self assess, assess ourselves. We do physically, but psychologically, we don't do it enough. So every morning, I'll get out of bed, and I will be typically thinking, it's cold, it's wet, Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks.
Thanks, uh, Trevor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Eugene Gilliams, my name. I'm a club member from the Ormond Gates Club. And uh, yesterday, Trevor says to me, Eugene, I want you to do MC for the night. So forgive me if you can't hear me, or uh, I'll get him back later. I said that to Philly when he came in. I said, we'll have to. Uh, We'd have to show him the sat now for Sligo, and someone in the panel just says to Eugene, uh, unfortunately Dublin aren't used to playing Sligo, but we're going to change that after we hear him tonight. So uh, we want to get out of, out of Philly as well, not alone tonight, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, great to see so many people in on, uh, on this GA event organised by the Oma Gates Club. So um, first off, put a boot of bus there for Trevor and his co-worker. That goes without saying. So look, at the, the format for tonight is on my left hand side with three guest speakers. I'm going to introduce each speaker and um, the, take it, each speaker is going to say a few words. We're going to have a questions and answer session at the end. Um, and as I said, look, there's no question. No question is going to be too awkward, too difficult or too challenging. So if you have a question, just answer, ask it. And by all means, we divert it to the panel. Um, so that's the way we do that at the end, and we hope to be kind of wrapped up here, you know, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes or anything about that, because I know everyone that's here is mad anxious to get home to get studied and finish their homework. So I, w I wouldn't like to be in the way of not having the homework and the, and the study and the projects done for the morning, so we'll, we'll move on fairly quickly. So look, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel and our uh, first, I'll introduce the three panel members. Uh, first here on, on our left is Christina. McInerney. Christina is the Educational and Training Coordinator for the Northwest Regional Drug and Alcohol Task Force. If you show your appreciation for Christina. Beside Christina is our local local Garth Shakana, local Nile man man. Most people know Nile. Nile Davy from from Sligo. Nile is a detective sergeant in charge from Angarda Shikon, as I said, and Niall is in, is in charge for the Sligo Leitrim Divisional, Divisional Drugs Unit. So Niall is going to say a few words, and so give Niall a good deal. And Niall is And our, our special guest of the evening, of course, is from the, the Dublin Senior Panel. Um, and I suppose it's, it's when, you, when you Google him or you, you, you look him up, it's very impressive. This man has not one, but two all Ireland's, two, I should say, two All-Star awards. And he has six all Ireland medals. Now that man deserves a good award. Well. Philly is here to tell his story. Um, he's from the, the, the Ballymum Kick, Kickens Club. But I was just the other bit of is and most you might have often looked and seen last year was it I think he launched his autobiography, the Boot the Choice. So Philly is going to tell us his story in, in a short while as well. So look at um, to start proceedings, I'm going to ask Christina to come over. Christina is going to do the first presentation, which is about ten minutes, uh, and then as I say, Niall will have a presentation and then we'll have Philly. So if you put your hands together again, please, for Christina. Thank you. to let you know that I have a dose of a cold since last Friday, but I would have had to be wheeled in here. I was going to make it no matter what happened. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to represent um, the Northwest Regional Drug and Alcohol Task Force as well. And I've got 10 minutes to give you a message, okay? And each of the panel tonight, we're hoping to confirm that message back to you. And we have an incredible spread of age groups here. And there's a lot about what I'm going to say that you already know. A drug is any substance that alters the way a person feels, thinks, or acts. This includes alcohol, and you will see alcohol underlined and in bold. So when you leave here tonight, you can be pretty sure that alcohol is a drug. Legal or illegal drugs, over-the-counter medications, and prescribed medications. These are the two most commonly used drugs in the Northwest region. There are other drugs used as well, but these are the ones that are mostly used. The illegal one and the legal one. 
There is no magic wand to take these substances out of our society. They're going to be there. And drugs are developing in the same way that technology is developing, with these new psychoactive substances that are chemical compounds that we have absolutely no idea what they contain until they're sent to a laboratory. And our medical professions have no idea what these drugs can do to the brain or the body. The only thing we can do with you tonight is to give you information. And you're always getting information. But with that information, you have a choice. And every choice you make, and no matter what age that is, every choice you make, there are consequences tied to that choice. You can choose to live well and live healthy, or you can choose to take the risk of getting involved in substances. And I can assure you, after 10 and a half years involved in the academia of this particular subject, every single person that takes a drink for the first time, or any other drug, have, you have no idea where that's going to end up. And I also want to let you know, after all the years and all the research and everything that I know about the actual subject, we have no idea who's going to end up addicted to these substances. Absolutely, there is no magic formula, and there are no magic solutions to this. And for all of you sitting in the audience, most are connected by family ties to someone who has had an addiction to alcohol or other drugs. Every drug has an impact on your brain. And I want you to hear that again. Because even if you take your medication, leave it out and you have a look at it, there are side effects attached to that. So every drug has an impact on your brain. You have a choice. When you're young, these things are going to come. It's part of our society. It's part of how we live. You're going to be offered substances. You're going to be offered alcohol. You're going to be offered cannabis. You're going to be offered other types of drugs. This is where you make the choice. It's not your parents making the choice. It's you making the choice. And you can choose to live healthy and well and reach your goals or you can choose to take a wee bit of risk with some of the substances. I'm not going to deny to you the reason that human beings use substances. It's because of the effects. But there are risks with them. It's your life. It's your choice. Is this what your aim is? And I want you to take that picture in. Is this what your aim is? Or is this what your aim is? Because for sure, those substances will get in the road of you reaching your potential. This is a control center. There's a lot of things going on there. There's computer systems, there's instructions, and there's things, messages being sent on a constant basis. This is your control center. And your brain is trying to send messages in a constant basis. I want you to look at this laptop. If we poured red wine on this laptop, what would happen? The functions of that laptop would dim down so much, the laptop would stop working. This is your control system. This is the impact that alcohol will have on your brain. It's a central nervous system depressant. And therefore, just like a dimmer switch, the more of the substance you pour into your body that goes through your bloodstream and reaches your brain, the more your signals are being dimmed down. Now here is something I was never told when I was growing up. That if you consume enough alcohol in a condensed period of time, that you can dim down the functions of your brain so much that your brain will struggle to send the signals for your heart to beat and for your lungs to breathe. And we as Irish families have experienced this. Some of us have actually lost friends and family due to the overconsumption of this particular drug, which is our legal drug, which surrounds us everywhere. The information and the health evidence that has come forth over this last 10 years is that it is a group one carcinogenic, 
that is a cancer-causing agent to the human species. The same as nicotine, in the same group as nicotine, and in the same group as asbestos. It is central nervous system depressant, and it is addictive physically and psychologically. I want you to look carefully at these images of the brain. The first one you see is a 15-year-old male non-drinker. Okay? If you have a look at the red there, there's quite a lot of activity going on. How many in here are 15 years old? Will you put your hands up to see the 15-year-olds? Okay, how many are 16? Okay, who's younger than 15, 16? Okay, now this is the very interesting thing about this. The brain on the other side is an image of a 15-year-old heavy episodic drinker, okay? And he is completely sober when that test is taken. And that's a memory test. So the use of alcohol, and the regular use of alcohol on the young developing brain has impact. We have no doubt about that. We know that it's a mood altering substance, and we know for a fact the younger a person drinks, the more chance they have of becoming addicted. Three times more of a chance of becoming addicted to that substance, depending on the age. So if we're spending time educating our children, getting them involved in sports, getting them grinds for their exams when they go to sit junior cert, etc. then it's time we also thought about protecting our young people's brains from these type of substances. One very important factor about this particular substance is if the mood ain't good, don't use. Because we know that because of the release of chemicals that you experience and the fact that it goes through your brain reward pathway, when that dissipates, then the brain actually struggles to raise its mood again. You can't think straight when you have consumed alcohol. You don't have the same emotional control. You don't have the same steadiness, coordination, or any of those things. And that's because the whole brain is impacted by the consumption of that substance. There are more deaths due to alcohol in this country than all of the illegal drugs added together. And our statistics actually tell us that's three a day. 900 people a year diagnosed with an alcohol-related cancer, 500 of them go on to die. So the figures are kind of shocking. Since all this research has been done, there's been an incredible amount of work by people, particularly um, involved in our government, in our politics, in our health sectors, in our research and in our academia. And basically they have finally decided that it is not an ordinary substance and it does need its own legislation. Okay, we'll get this wee video to work. If we can. Okay, it's, um, we're gonna have a technological fault. But basically it's a public health alcohol bill. And what you will see going into the future is that there won't be any more advertising in cinemas for underage. There won't be highly available and highly seeable alcohol in our shops. There won't be sports sponsorship. So go and have a wee look at that public health alcohol bill and see how things are going to change. This is the other drug. And this is the other drug that's commonly used in the Northwest. It's second after alcohol. But there's a lot of myth about the use of this particular drug. There is no drug that doesn't have a side effect. There is no drug that is completely harmless. Okay? We do know from our evidence that cannabis can have an impact on people's thoughts. Thought problems can develop. Social problems can develop. Debt problems can develop. Attention problems can develop. Memory problems. Motivation problems. And smoking it also affects your respiratory system. We know that it induces a heart rate, okay, an increased heart rate. It lowers blood pressure. It creates appetite stimulation, dry mouth and dizziness and that. We also know that each of you is a very unique and specially made up individual. 
and the impact on you may be different to the impact on your friends. And our services, our mental health services, are seeing cannabis-induced psychosis. So it is not a completely harmless and ineffective drug either. This is a very short presentation, so what I'm going to say to you here is that we've got two hands there, okay? And particularly you young people, you might think that your parents are making the choices for you, but as you have less and less supervision and as you reach 14, 15, 16, believe it or not, the choices that you make impact on your life and you're actually responsible for those choices. One of the hands you can see where it says life and family and friends, success and strong, okay? And the other hand, it says marijuana, heroin, addiction, meth, crack, all of those things. And you can see very, very pictorially there that your choice is in your hands and the choices you make have consequences. So when you're offered these substances, and you will be offered them, and if you're 15 or 16, our statistics tell us some of you are already involved in these substances, think about the choice, think about the consequence. Keep yourself healthy and well, and keep yourself safe. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Christina, for a very informative uh, um, uh, presentation. So, without further ado, I now call on Nile um, Nile Dave, your local uh, local detective sergeant in charge of the Sligo Leitrim Divisional Drugs Unit, to uh, say a few words. Uh, over to you, Nile. Thanks, Eugene. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to say. Thank you to the Club Women Morgales. I think this is a tremendous uh, initiative. It's a tremendous thing for the local GA club to do. To bring a body of people together in such numbers that we have tonight, I think it's a credit to you, well done. Um, well done to all the parents and kids that decided to turn up. And I'm just here um, to just give you an overview of what the situation is locally, as I and the team that I work with find round the area that you all live in. Um, I know many people in the room and I'm sure many people know me. Um, I'm a slave man myself, so I'm still waiting on the Ireland to come here for you. <laughs> and uh, I've been involved in the drugs game through the guards for most of my service. I'm in my 34th year in the guard and I'm about 25 years, give or take, involved in the drugs area. Um, Christine's message is very important and that's exactly um, what we're seeing locally on a daily basis around the area. Uh, the one thing that strikes me is two words in Christine's message, one word in particular that's very relevant to Philly is the word choice. And uh, in my time in the guards, I've seen some wonderful things, I've seen some terrible things, but in relation to drugs, it's totally indiscriminate. We are dealing with families, young people, uh, adults of all ranges of ages and from social dynamic in every parish in this county and we cover County Leitrim as well when we can. And drugs are everywhere. Let there be no mistake that, you know, drugs is everywhere. I'm sure there's people even in this room that have, you know, experienced something in relation to drugs, be it uh, legal drugs as Christine talked about and we deal with the the aspects and the fallouts of heavy alcohol abuse in the game that we're in, but we also deal with uh, prescription medication that's been abused and sold in large quantities around the place, and we are coming across quantities of those in very significant numbers and people that are, you know, importing them and buying them over the internet, particularly uh, Valiums and stuff like that, D10s, D5s, and everything else. Um, I just basically start that, you know. We're a small unit, we're a division of drugs unit, we're based here in Sligo Town. I have five people working for me at the moment, one girl and four lads. And, you know, some people might be under the apprehension or the little bit of misconception that we're in an ideal world here in the northwest around Sligo and, you know, we're a little bit removed and immune from everything. 
I can tell you now, and I don't say this to frighten anybody, but we have everything here available to us that's available in any other part of this country, from cannabis to cocaine to heroin to ketamine to MDNA or more commonly known as ecstasy, you name it, the range of stuff that we are coming across, we are coming across it on a very regular basis. And as a young fellow, I worked in Dublin and I got an interest in and got involved in working in the drug area in Dublin with colleagues that introduced me to that area of work and I took a big interest in it. And I remember 25 years ago, I started to do little bits of talks to community groups and social groups and schools and whatever you have. And naively I said to myself, you know, that cannabis and maybe a bit of cocaine was what we would see by the time I ended my service from this area in the northwest. We see everything here now. We have our heroin addicts here in Sligo. They travel on the train or travel by public transport mostly daily or on a maybe a couple of times a weekly basis to the Midlands or up to the city. Uh, cannabis abuse, we're coming across cannabis in vast quantities everywhere we go. And the one thing I'd say to you is, is particularly adults and parents, um, don't be afraid to open up the discussion with your kids. See what they're hearing. See what they're experiencing through their peers and at school. See what they're seeing themselves. Talk to them. Um, you know, they need to know and you need to know what's happening in the world and what, you know. Uh, our work brings us into a lot of different areas as well and I would be very strongly of the view, and the team that work with me and the people that support us and what we do, be very strongly of the view that we're not here, or our function as police people is not to make the life of young people difficult, or not to uh, prevent them or hinder any opportunities they have by a little bit of casual drug abuse, or not, not drug abuse, but drug use, through nothing more than maybe a bit of experimentation or a bit of an inquisitiveness on their behalf. And we have a scheme built into the criminal justice scheme called the juvenile liaison scheme that you know operates on the basis that everybody is entitled to a chance in life and i would be very very strongly in favor of that and maybe more than one chance on some occasions because people need a couple of chances in life, life to find out where they're going and what they're going to do and i would say to all the young people in the room boys and girls um, i was like you were one time whether you like to believe it or not I was 12 one time, I was 14 one time, I was 16 one time, I'm a bit older now. And there was people in my life's journey that gave me a chance. I didn't always get it right. I didn't uh, go too mad, but there was a couple of things. And people would say to you, how did that fellow ever end up in the, in the guards? But definitely, people need a chance. People need to, you know, make mistakes. But in making a mistake, they need to have the opportunity of moving on from that mistake and maybe getting their life back on track. But I would also say that drug use and experimentation with drugs